an with an interactive diagnostic session and a very special surprise. Now, I don't want to steal um, more, any more time, so I conclude by thanking all of you and all the speakers that uh, who will animate the show tonight. So I wish you a pleasant evening and a very good weekend. And I'm looking forward to meet you soon in person. So please keep safe. Now let's start. And I'm glad to introduce Giacomo Savini that will lead the show. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Gilda. Thanks for inviting me. It's a, a great pleasure to collaborate uh, with this uh, uh, great Italian manufacturer of uh, ophthalmic high technology devices. And uh, uh, I will try to keep the time of all the speakers uh, so that uh, we can uh, uh, have no delays. And uh, my first, the first presenter will be Dr. Puya Kamal, uh, who, will talk, who will talk about what's the true picture here. So the first case, please. Um, thank you, uh, Giacamo. Uh... I'll just share my screen. So, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank CSO and Francesco for giving us this opportunity. So I'm going to share a uh, very few short cases and scenarios which we come across in our practice and just see what the true picture is. So uh, these are two patients, a normal looking, looking topography, uh, similar cylinder. So we plan, went ahead and planned a topo guided LASIK for this patient. However, post-operatively, the first patient was 2020 very happy and second patient was reading 2020, but uh, that she was very unhappy. So what was happening here? The topography of both the patients post-operatively are uh, similar, well-centered ablation, everything is fine. So what we refractive surgeons a lot of time uh, concentrate is just on the tip of, tip of the iceberg. But however, uh, we forget to see what's hidden beneath and we need to start decoding. So my presentation is going to be uh, concentrated on how this tool, amazing tool can help us uh, in decoding these cases. So the first part of my talk would be how an epithelium on nerves can impact the outcomes of refractive surgery. So uh, me with um, uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty, we have uh, and our team have started this study where we see the nerves which impact the refractive surgery and its outcomes in different uh, aspects. So uh, these are how the healthy nerves look. It, it's done by a confocal microscopy and these are how the unhealthy nerves look. Uh, you can see some dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are nothing but the inflammatory cells. And uh, if you have a lot of inflammation in your eye, your results can be uh, way off. And these are the mature dendritic cells and these are the microneuromas, uh, which are also abnormal in the eye. So let's see three cases. Uh, these are the three patients with normal looking uh, mebography in a preoperative workup. We do tend to see the ocular surface, how it is. And our group has published the paper, uh, this work that if the ocular surface is healthy, the nerves are going to be healthy. So what we did is we just tried to correlate if the nerves and the ocular surface are healthy, how your epithelium looks. This epithelium are very regularized. At the same time, if your ocular surface is unhealthy, uh, your confocal, the nerves are going to be unhealthy. A lot of inflammatory cells you can see here, uh, dendritic cells are present and you are in the, uh, the nerves are very scanty. Now let's look at the epithelium map. Epithelium map are irregular. You can see a lot of irregularities present here in all the three maps. So this is what we found. So if all these patients undergo surgery, what will happen? Uh, okay. uh, then we try to correlate this epithelial mapping uh, to molecular markers. We do a lot of work on tear biomarkers and how it impacts your uh, various surgeries and diseases. So the patients with normal epithelium and a normal ocular surface had a very, like hardly any uh, inflammatory markers. They were very healthy in terms of your tears. But uh, when you see the unhealthy epithelium, they had a lot of these inflammatory markers present. If you see here, all these are inflammatory cells like MMP9, ICOM1s, TNF alphas, everything, uh, and they are unhealthy. And if we do a surgery on them, there are these are three patients, the top one with a healthy epithelium. This is There is some irregularity present, but however, still okay. And these are a highly irregular epithelium. Uh, and these are how the nerves are, healthy nerves. Uh, here there is somewhat uh, scanty nerves and here there are dendritic cells present. And they, have, they correlate with the OSDI scoring, which is a subjective scoring given by a patient. 
uh, if you do a lasik or a refractive any other refractive surgery post operatively this is how their epithelium look, are going to be like uh, the first patient who had a healthy epithelium uh, has post operatively uh, healthy epithelium as well and the third patient with which had unhealthy nerves has landed up and an unhealthy epithelium has even more irregularities present on their epithelial mapping compared to those of normals and this is how their nerves are there are lot more dendritic cells the inflammatory cells present and the discomfort of these patients are much higher than compared to the ones with normal epithelium or normal nerves and this is the visual quality this is how your visual quality is the first patient with normal epithelium uh, normal nerves have a uh, very good vision however with irregular epithelium and abnormal nerves the visual quality drops and this is how they see and these are the patients who come into your clinic post operatively complaining of glare and halos which are way beyond your dry eyes or ocular surface health so uh, just to summarize how does it impact your uh, surgical outcomes when you do any surgery the OS, the post operatively discomfort is going to be higher which will lead to post uh, poor nerve regeneration poor wound healing uh, which is an irregular epithelium uh, which will affect your optics and patients will have complain of glare and halos which will lead to a poor quality of life affecting both your patients and your uh, and yourself as doctors when you're treating them because you don't know what is happening so now let's come to a uh, role of bowmans what is the true picture here so this is a patient who underwent smile uh, no financial interest here complains of uh, post operatively complains of blurring of vision and glare but the quantity of vision was like you can see here it was 6 by 6 parts at 3 months the quantity of vision is good but why is the quality of vision poor what is happening here all the other uh, dry eye evaluation and everything was within normal limits so uh, we went ahead and saw that how their octs look and you know how their uh, healing patterns are so very interestingly ms39 has a tool of appellation like cornea where you can you know it indents the cornea makes it straight and you can actually magnify your view and see what is happening so if you see here the 2020 happy patient uh, you see the bowmans layer it is quite regular and here if you see the patient who is unhappy there you can see some bowmans wrinkle present so this was the reason probably the patient was seeing poor and uh, this was how the uh, visual optical quality summary was the patient with normal bowman's uh, layer had a uh, very good quality of vision however the patient with wrinkles had poor quality of vision and this is the uh, paper published by our group which talks about the same thing that if there are bowman's wrinkle present then yes your quality of vision can be affected coming to a uh, role of aberrations in refractive surgery a uh, lot of work has been done by our group on epithelial zernic and refractive surgery and now we are moving towards ai based uh, quantifying of this uh, changes so what happens is at till now what aberrations we are looking at is just the corneal uh, aberrations which are divided into total anterior posterior but however we uh, never looked at epithelial zernic case so in 2015 our group first published this paper where they anal they utilized a novel zernic application just from the epithelium to differentiate between the normal and the keratoconic eyes so now we can analyze the same with uh, this tool uh, this additionally gives us the epithelial zernic profile and you can see here how your normal epithelium uh, the zernic profile in your normal uh, patient is and in your keratoconic eyes are and this are how your aberrations look uh, in normal and suspicious eyes so till now we were not able to quantify it but now we can actually see what is happening at your epithelial level so let's see two different epithelial profiles the first one is a regular one the second one is an irregular one and if you see here the aberrations i hear with the normal limits and here they are like a bit higher than the normal but interestingly if you see here that there is a significant amount of cylinder present from the epithelium in this eyes compared to one that of normal here there is no cylinder present so is this giving us some clue that we need to take this into consideration while we are doing our surgeries let's see this case example a patient has a cylinder of about minus 2 diopteric cylinder this is the epithelial thickness bit irregularity is present but if you see the zernike profile there is 0.85 diopter of uh, cylinder coming just from epithelial thickness we were planning a topo guided treatment and uh, we just saw that the patient acceptance was minus 2 uh, two diopters uh, in cylinder but however the uh, your machine was measuring around minus 3.32 diopters and we would go ahead and do a refractive surgery for this patient but the question here was 
do we consider that this point eight five is coming from the epithelium, or we just go ahead and treat what your uh, topolizers are giving? So that is also what we need to uh, think about. And you know, uh, if we if we don't take the epithelial zernic into consideration, then postoperatively we can land up into refractive surprises. Uh, what is the role of aberrations? A similar aberration in cataract surgery. These are the two patients again, similar normal looking topographies. Uh, so what we do in now, today's era is we take the uh, K1, K2s uh, and we do an IL master, go ahead and do a surgery. However, the same patient, the first patient had a good visual outcome and the second patient here had a poor visual outcome. So the question here was again, what was happening to this two patients? Why these two patients had different outcomes when there was no astigmatism actually present on the topographies? So uh, we went ahead and uh, what we do see, uh, you know, how we plan our surgeries is just looking at the lower or the higher order aberrations. But we went back and looked at their epithelial maps. Again, see if the no patient, this first patient who is happy has a regular epithelium. However, the second patient here has a few, uh, like a lot of irregularities present here in the center, which is the pupillary area and the periphery. And on the aberration, zerni, ep epithelial zernike profile, the 0.85 cylinder is coming just from your uh, epithelium. So this patient went ahead with a uh, cataract surgery and post-operatively uh, during their healing, this patient had even more irregularities present and the cylinder had increased uh, post-operatively. And this is just from the epithelial zernike compared to that of this patient where you can't see any cylinder. So probably this is the reason that this patient is unhappy and the second, pa uh, second patient is unhappy and the first patient where it was a healthy epithelium where we did a surgery, he was happy. So uh, till now, what we see is whenever there's a poor meiography or an unhealthy ocular surface, we treat it. Uh, we know that you know it gives you an unreliable steep uh, and flat K and it affects your post-operative outcomes. But however, uh, till date, what we were not seeing is the irregular epithelium and it needs to be taken into consideration according to this patient. Uh, so again, just to summarize this cataract uh, role in uh, MS-39, we at this point of time see the anterior posterior total higher order aberrations to decide whether you, a patient is fit for premium IOL surgery or not but it this teaches us that we need we need to also look at the epithelial zernike profile and the epithelial profile and then take a call that if it is healthy then probably this is a then yes this is a good patient for a, a, a premium IOL surgery like a multifocals or toric but however if there is an irregular epithelium present then uh, it is not probably a good idea to go ahead with a premium IOL surgery. Uh, this is just my last case. Uh, patient wanted, uh, just on the same line, a patient wanted a, a cataract surgery and was planning for a multifocal IOL because he's just 45 years of age. So he wanted complete independence from glasses. Uh, this was his topography, uh, nothing unusual. Biomechanics is also normal. Just you can see some irregularities present here, but otherwise it looks grossly fine. This is the same patient, two eyes. This is the right eye. Uh, epithelial mapping looks okay. No elevation changes present here. And in the epithelial zernike, uh, there is not much of cylinder present. But however, this is the left eye of the same patient. And just see here, the irregularity is present and the cylinder is also showing up as minus 0.5. So the question here is, should we advise a multifocal IOL or a premium IOL for this patient? Uh, and this is the EKR map. You can see here, it's just a single peak with hardly any uh, uh, disturbances present. But however, here, there are few uh, disturbances present here. And you can see few like peaks are there, but three or four. So, you know, this is not a very good idea. So the question here is, how do we go ahead? Should it's a young patient, does he deserve a premium IL or not? The, uh, the, the looking, uh, just taking a recap, that patient does have a lot of ocular surface problems. You can, uh, this is an algorithm by AICRS, how you treat the ocular surface and make the ocular surface healthy. But how, uh, and just uh, to summarize, like you can, uh, this is how you treat your ocular surface and you can apply a one of your modern dry eye day therapies, uh, wait for four to six weeks, you give anti-inflammatory agents, lubricating drops, wait for four to six weeks, and then plan a surgery to have an optimal outcome. So uh, aberrations just not are from your cornea. It is now from your, uh, we just knew that it, it is from your total anterior posterior cornea or your internal aberrations. But now there is an addition that we need to also take your epithelial aberrations into consider, uh, consideration. So just to summarize, epithelial mapping has a very significant role in your refract, in refractive and cataract surgeries. 
it can help in uh, so, uh, differentiating normal and suspect topographies the epithelial profile has an impact on your cylinder so you need to take that into consideration it helps in your premium oil planning and uh, there is an importance of bowman's layer analysis in refractive surgery thank you excellent, excellent. Th very interesting. Uh, can you hear me well yeah uh, very interesting uh, presentation actually uh, i have been using the ms39 for I think around four years, and uh, I did never include up to date the uh, epithelial map as a preoperative screening tool uh, for either corneal or intraocular lens refractive procedures. I think that since next Monday, I will change my routine and just give a look uh, as you teach uh, in these beautiful cases. It would be great to to plan a, a study, a clinical trial, uh, to make a correlation between uh, epithelial mapping, aberration, higher order aberrations, and quality of vision, so that uh, uh, it will be we will have numbers to say that uh, uh, there's a cutoff uh, uh, below which uh, uh, we should do or not do some kind of surgeries. Anyway, the idea is very beautiful. Congratulations. And uh, I think uh, that uh, to be on time, I don't know if there is any other question, just one, otherwise uh, we get late. Any other question from the audience? No, so uh, I think it's my time and I introduce myself. Uh, well, I'm going to share my screen and uh, wait a second okay and uh, i will present a couple of uh, a single case that is present on the atlas and since this is a short presentation uh, i was uh, uh, looking forward to giving you an update on one of the most beautiful and interesting options of the MS39, which is the IOT power calculation by ray tracing. So I will present these two um, uh, show presentations. This was a case that uh, I operated on uh, uh, just after Christmas in January before the lockdown. And the eye had uh, uh, pseudo exfoliation. The patient was 75 years old. And uh, when I was chopping the nucleus, I broke the posterior capsule. So I had uh, to move the nucleus uh, into the anterior chamber. And when I was uh, maneuvering and disassembling the nucleus, uh, I uh, made a big error and uh, uh, damaged the endothelium with the spatula and not the peripheral, but the central endothelium. I immediately realized that uh, this was a mistake. Then I implanted a, a three-piece axis of in the sulcus with the optic captured in the rexis. And the day after when uh, I examined the patient, uh, I was not so surprised to have a, a very low corrected distance visual acuity, just 0.2. I was more surprised about the myopic shift of minus three because uh, the lens uh, was uh, uh, adjusted according to the position in the sulcus about the rexis, uh, uh, the optic was behind the rexis. So I thought it, it should have been uh, more or less metropic uh, while it was myopic by minus three. And uh, looking at the maps of the MS39, uh, you can see that there was a big central cornea steepening and uh, uh, a relevant uh, central steepening with more than 700 microns in the center and the whole cornea was uh, thicker than uh, usual but was what was more interesting was to have a look uh, at the sagittal um, uh, images of the oct this is a, a, a no CT image from the 25 scans of the map. And you can clearly see that the 
endothelium is detached in the, cent in the center of the cornea. And this was my fault. It's difficult to have the same clear image uh, at the zip lamp, as you can see here on the left. So on postoperative day two, I injected an air bubble into the anterior chamber and uh, uh, in order to reattach the endothelium and uh, this was a successful procedure because immediately on postoperative day three, you see that uh, there was a good improvement of central corneal thick, uh, thickness from 700 to 600 with around 100 microns of gain in, in CCT. Sorry. And little by little, day after day, the endothelium reattached, although, uh, hyper -refract, although it remained hyper-refractive and irregular, and uh, visual acuity little by little increased. But the great thing of, uh, MS, of anterior segment OCT by MS39 is that I was able to see the healing of the endothelium day by day. So that at the uh, postoperative month two, uh, visual, rec visual recovery was almost complete and the endothelium was fully reattached. And uh, at the last control, six, seven months after surgery, uh, both at the slit lamp on the right and uh, at the OCT on the left, you, see, you can see that uh, the cornea is almost normal and the patient is no more complaining. So uh, with any shampoo camera, this kind of this uh, level of quality in the corneal uh, images would be impossible. And this here you can see that uh, if we compare the preoperative map that is on the left and the postoperative map on the right, uh, we see that uh, they are almost the same. The CCT before and after surgery is okay. You see here also a nice feature of the, of the latest Phoenix software where the number of months are shown in the um, comparative in the differential map. The same for uh, very little difference for the curvature. So in conclusion, anterior segment OCT enables us to visualize and follow up the endothelium and uh, uh, at the same time with the same scans, corneal topography and tomography allow us to understand the reasons of visual loss and myopic shift. Then a few minutes, as I told you before, to give you an update on IOL power calculation by ray tracing uh, with MS39. Uh, you know that the IOL power module uh, can uh, be used in both virgin and post-refractive surgery eyes is very easy to use. You just have to enter the axial length measured by any optical biometer. And the software provides us with the IOT power, the predicted sphere equivalent, the predicted sphere, the predicted astigmatism, uh, the predicted lens position, which is predicted using a proprietary algorithm based on anterior segment measurements. And uh, you have a different IOL models inside, otherwise you can use a generic IOL model with the ULIB A constants. And this study, which is still ongoing, now includes 30, 31 eyes with previous myopic LASIK or PRK. Axial length was measured by uh, the Aladdin. And we had the several different models of IOS. The most common was the Microsoft IQ. And uh, we did not use the a constant provided by the manufacturer, by, but those provide, uh, uh, available on the ULIB and now the IOLCON.org website. And the main outcome was the difference between the post-operative and the predicted uh, refraction, which is the, production, the prediction error. We did some changes in, in the axial length because uh, uh, we use the original reading from optical biometry. We use the one cock adjustment that has been published a few years ago and two adjustments, one for the holiday one and one for the holiday two that are available on the Hicksop 
software by Holiday and uh, have also been published published on JCRS January 2019. These are the average Excel length from 27.81 in the original reading of the Latin, decreased to by around half a millimeter with the one cock adjustment and much less by the holiday one and holiday two adjustments. But this is, these are the numbers that I want to show you. If we take the original axial length, we have the um, around 45% of eyes with the prediction error lower than half a diopter. And you can see that using the holiday adjustments, either the one for the holiday one or those, that for the holiday two, that percentage increases up to around 75% of eyes within half a diopter. And for an, an sample whose ax, mean axial length is around 27 millimeter, this would be a great result even in emetropic non-operated eyes. And we can have this in long post LASIK eyes with a mean prediction error very close to zero and a median absolute error of just 0.24 diopters. And these numbers are better than those that I previously found with the Pentacam on the left, where the best formula had 70% of eyes with a prediction error within the half a diopter and very close, but still slightly better than those available with the uh, Galilei G6. So in conclusion, if the MS39 with the, the ray tracing module can provide us with accurate IOL power calculation in eyes with previous LASIK and PRK is so much simple. You don't need any historical data, no Excel spreadsheet. And uh, uh, in this moment, it looks that on my small sample, 31 eyes is a, the most accurate method to calculate the IOL power. That's all, thank you. If you have any question, I'm here for you. I see uh, one uh, question from uh, Dr. Tello. Uh, for ray tracing calculation with what kind of a constant? Uh, yeah, I suggest you. I suggest you to uh, use the optimized constants from the ULIB website. Uh, at this moment, it's probably the best thing from a practical point of view. Probably some purists, some theoretical engineers may not be, may not agree, but the results are very good in this way. And uh, well, if there are no other questions, I will, uh, I would uh, introduce, or oh, maybe there's still not. Okay, no. Uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Roy Sherry, who will talk about um, Kertoconus masquerades. Good evening, uh, friends, and uh, thank you, sir, and thanks, uh, CSO, for giving me this uh, opportunity to our work on uh, using the MS-39 in different forms. My talk today is Keratoconus uh, masquerades. These are my financial interests. Let me start with the case one. A 22-year-old male comes with history of decrease in the vision. The vision has uh, dropped and it's not reaching 2020. This is his uh, visual activity. The fundus and the corneal examination was normal. Now, if you look at the pentacam here, these are your suspicious areas, there is an elevation, there's a posterior elevation. There's nothing much seen on your bad D, but definitely there's something happening. This is his left eye, exactly the same thing. And uh, you see those elevation maps out here. The question is a 22 year old male coming like this, most of the time, the first sign of your diagnosis is you would think that there is something to do with the keratoconus. And what is interesting here is, if somebody uses both the pentagram and the, the Corvus, uh, the maps, the uh, Professor Vinci Gura is here, so we'd be happy to know that the biomechanics of the CBI and his Vinci Gura report was normal. The keratoconus looking picture, but a normal biomechanics 
is something which we need to go and see what is happening out here. But when you look at the MS39 out here, you see a complete something similar, the anterior and the stroma is completely normal. And the posterior part is completely normal. So that means whatever was happening was happening at the epithelial level and that is what was causing the change. Exactly the same thing out here. This is your map and the stroma, which is uh, <clears throat> the minus of the epithelium was completely normal. So this anti-elevation matches to your pentacam, so that cannot be reliable. So what happens here is, this is a case of completely normal stroma. There's no keratoconus in this, even though this looked keratoconic and this patient needed uh, the ocular surface treatment, allergy treatment and other things. But for some reason, there was confusion between the biomechanics and this, the biomechanics was actually the true picture and what was the true picture was the MS-39 out here because it gave, it gave you a complete picture, which is different. Uh, in our lab, we also work with this uh, prototype OCT, a research OCT to study the collagen. It is important because a lot of my cases needs to know how a collagen looks. And for example, this is how a normal collagen, this is a normal topography. You can see that the peripheral fibers are stronger, the central fibers are different. And when you have a lower biomechanics, the peripheral fibers are, you know, they're much weaker. This is what you see. This is, uh, we call it as a polarization sensitivity. This is how it looks, the normal collagen. I told you the peripheral strong, the central are much more denser. This is how the imaging is done. But we wanted to study, are we seeing the same thing in this patient? The, the patient on whom this is the normal for your reference. And we felt that this patient was completely normal. This we did it just to prove that the machine, the MS-39 was giving us exactly what uh, we wanted to see in the state of collagen, that the collagen was really strong or healthy out there. And uh, what, was the what was the reason for this patient to have it is because this patient had a microneuroma, which, uh, which exactly at those points in the confocal microscope, you can see that these microneuromas could change the epithelial remodeling, and this could be one of the factors out here. So when you look at this case, it had a suspicious looking topography when you're looking from a uh, shine fluke base imaging, but when you looked at it from, uh, from uh, epithelium and the stromal part, it was completely normal. So this is how it helps us to one shot look at the complete picture in a different way. So this is uh, the whole flow of this thing, suspicious topography, stromal biomechanics, stroma was normal. We did just to prove it, we did the collagen imaging. It was an irregular epithelium because the nerves were poor. So this is the flow of this case. And everything falls into a pattern. And only if it falls into a pattern because we were able to image the stroma and the epithelium in a different way. The case number two, ghosting of images, a 42 year old male, very interesting. It's only two months imaging, uh, two months ghosting, exactly the same picture what you saw in the previous thing. Posterior elevation, the pentacam looks like it has a keratoconus. The biomechanics again, brilliantly normal. This is again, uh, thanks to Professor Vinsigura and his team. And what you see here is an abnormal case and you see the map here very clearly. And that is because that area, what is abnormal here, is actually an epithelial hyperplasia. Again, a localized hyperplasia, which is the one which is changing. This is anti-elevation. There's nothing on the stroma. The stroma looks healthy. Again, a microneuroma. The microneuroma sometimes create these localized changes, which could change the, the way the topography is. And these are all masquerades for keratoconus. Both the patients was referred to me because they were being diagnosed as keratoconus. So they were clearly in a bit epithelial change, which was creating this change, which was creating this problem. And uh, again, we did the PSOCT, the polarization OCT on them. And you can see that the fibers in the periphery and the centers are strong. So that was perfectly normal. The coming to the, in the masquerade, the one of the most important thing in a keratoconus masquerade is linking the biomechanics. The biomechanics looks at 
different zones uh, of uh, stroma. But what really happens is many times the epithelium actually is creating confusion to the biomechanics. So we should be understanding the biomechanics more from the stroma and then it builds it. So because when you combine a topography and a biomechanics, the topography is heavily affected by your epithelium. For example, you can see that there are a lot of different epithelial changes and your stroma is all normal. Everything is normal. But your biomechanics, is the bad Ds are completely showing it as abnormal here because it is because of the epithelial changes here. So it is very important that the bad D and all your indices are heavily dependent on your epithelium. The epithelium changes the way the bad D is. For example, you can see this case, you have an inferior steepening and you can see here on the MS39 here, it's the steepening is from the epithelium. And you can see that the stroma is completely normal. The post elevation is normal. This patient, we would have labeled it as a suspect keratoconus. We probably would have called him for a routine checkup or we would not have advised him surgery. This patient, I did a PRK on him because trans PRK because it is an irregular epithelium and it can be regularized. It's very important and even here, this patient, the bad is in the suspicious zone, but your biomechanics is normal. That means that the biomechanics, what is led is for, it's, it's closely follows the stromal point of view. It does not follow always the, the curvature point of view from our topographies. And again, an elevation here. And like Dr. Pooja mentioned, the cylinder is coming from here and the stroma is completely normal, even though this looks suspicious. So what I'm trying to say is that your elevation is a very important factor in understanding biomechanics. I know at this point of time, we have not linked this to the biomechanical parameters and eventually, I feel there will be a very good synchronized harmony between a biomechanics to the stromal elevation compared to a complete anterior curvature maps. The case three is when you have multiple indices, all, all machines have multiple indices, it's humanly impossible for our brain to actually pick up which indices should be the best one. So what we've been working in the past is we have to measure this one here, but we end up always measuring this and that's the Bauman. So we, this is something, the work in progress, this is not uh, part of the software or not part of MS-39. I just wanted to tell you that there's a lot of potential to, to dif differentiate the masquerade versus a true case. And uh, we're using uh, a random forest uh, AI parameter, AI based metrics to study and this part of this paper, which we did on a OCT, not on the MS-39, but a different OCT was the uh, best paper last year in the AO conference, American Academy conference. And we started working on AI on MS-39 from the stromal surface, not the epithelium from the stromal surface, because from the stroma, you're actually able to get a multiple better option. For example, let's look at this patient. She, this is his topography. This is a refractive error, perfectly normal. You have a, a small avoid in elevation. The CBI is little on the suspicious side, some amount of uh, changes, but stroma is completely normal. The anterior elevation is normal. The stroma is normal. And this is the, the left eye of this patient. Uh, we did the uh, OCT, I, the collagen imaging, perfectly normal. Just compared with this, uh, it's looking because the yellow means this, the peripheral fibers, they are much more stronger, much more tighter, and the central fibers are a little weaker. So you can, this is how a physiology of the cornea is, and you can see that they're perfectly healthy. And uh, we did run, we, this is a, a software which we built, uh, it's, a, it's on our own, and we did a lot of indices, uh, we're doing an AI on it, and uh, we picked up that we, all these indices were at the Bowman's level, not at the epithelial level. And uh, this is what we did. And the, mesh, the AI did say that is a healthy in all the parameters because it had a baseline. AI needs a baseline to read uh, unhealthy corneas. So there is a huge hope of using AI in the future to predict 
based on its own database, what is healthy and what is not. And this is what is going to be the future of predictive modeling. And uh, we're trying to build this kind of a software which uh, looks at prediction of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of, of different surgeries. To sum up, it's an epithelium, the stromal mapping, if you're using biomechanics, whether Dr. Professor Vincigura's maps, or uh, you're using the TBI maps, it has to be looked at it from the stromal context, not the epithelial context. Thank you. Congratulations again. Uh, excellent work. Uh, this is something very new to me. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I'm learning a lot from uh, all of you. Uh, I will take more and more attention to the epithelial mapping and uh, these uh, cases of uh, uh, keratoconus masquerades are really interesting. Is there any question from the audience uh, uh, about this? Uh, um, well, there's, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a question from Dr. Tripko. Is the collagen imaging going to be incorporated by the MS39 and, and already Francisco Caronis, uh, Francisco Versace told that uh, this is impossible uh, at the moment, uh, maybe in the future. Yeah. Uh, I, I, used, I used that to prove what, what it was actually telling. But uh, we need a completely different light source, completely different uh, programming for that. Yeah, I have a question, please. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for, for the nice cases. Uh, actually, my question is about the first case. Uh, usually, it's unusual to see that keratoconus is the bulge is superior. But what we noticed from the the epithelial mapping that is that rather than we have a a hyperplasia in the upper part of the epithelium, we have a thinning in the inferior part of the epithelium where the thickness is around 30 microns. Is that right? Yes, absolutely right. Uh, one of the things what we are seeing very, very commonly nowadays is uh, the nerves uh, show this microneuroma-like pictures. They're like, uh, the nerves have a small, like a small swelling. And when you have them, then you see a localized hypertrophy of epithelium, which only can be picked up if you have an epithelial map and a stromal map to really see. So you're right, even in the pentagon, if you really go back and see that area is more thicker compared to the inferior one. So it, it, even though it looks like a keratoconus picture, it's not actually a keratoconus, but having an epithelial map actually helps you to prove it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there, there are still two uh, questions from the audience. Uh, one from Dr. Yasser Rifai asking if there is any work correlating epithelial mapping and biomechanics. Can, uh, can you answer? We are working on it at this point of time and uh, we, it will take probably a few more months to uh, come out with, with this uh, data. And something very similar from Dr. Bezad Barazande. Is it, is, is it true epithelium can sometimes affect biomechanics despite we know stroma should be the main source? Okay, more or less the same question. So you are still working on this yeah. direction. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, Rohit, um, of course, uh, don't spend any time on that because it, uh, that it would be a waste of time, right? Think about it. The epithelium is just a bunch of cuboidal cells sitting on the stroma. They have zero tensile strength, 0, 0. 0.0001 maybe. So no, the answer to that question is the epithelium does not contribute to the biomechanics of the cornea, zero, okay? What the epithelium can do if it is edematous is give you false data about the mechanics of the cornea in devices that use puff air puff applination. And so it'll affect your measurements because the device has a fictitious measurement because the epithelium becomes boggy, let's say, and it absorbs mm -hmm. the mechanics. But, the, but when, when someone asks about the biomechanics of the cornea, what they're thinking is, 
diagnosing keratoconus. And I think what you demonstrated very nicely is that the epithelium can fake keratoconus because of the way that we are trained to look at topography. We have to untrain ourselves to thinking that topography is diagnostic. Stromal topography would be diagnostic, but we've never seen that before. And, we, and I've been using epithelium for 25 years as a proxy for the stromal surface. This device allows us to look directly at the stromal surface. I mean, we, we have published many years ago a paper on stromal topography by subtracting epithelium from topography. Um, but this device, of course, is doing it in a much better way. So I think you know that kind of answers the question, I hope. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have to go on because uh, uh, we are still on time. Uh, and I would like to introduce and invite uh, uh, to give his talk, Dr. Theo Seiler, how to determine keratoconus progression with the MS39. Hey, hi, everybody. Good evening. I just need to. Um, OK. Um, OK. So good evening, everybody. Um, I'm talking today about um, the definition or determination of progression and keratoconus with the um, MS39. And um, I have no financial disclosure regarding that topic. And I would like to start with a case that you see here, a typical or uh, regular keratoconus patient with a typical anterior curvature map. And um, the same patient with another curvature map. And what we see here, I think everybody agrees with me that um, a, an increase of roughly three diopters in, in maximal keratometry indicates a progression of that patient. Here you can see the difference map between both, um, between both examinations and an increase of three diopters again. I think uh, most of the um, people attending that talk would indicate a cross-linking in that patient. However, the interesting thing is, um, check on the left and on the right, the date when the um, measurement was obtained and it's exactly on the same day and it's exactly the same time. So it's just a consecutive measurement with an increase of three diopters, which is quite a big noise of the device. And um, here I would like to point out what are actually the ectasia progression thresholds using the MS39 in keratectasia. First, I would um, like to give a small excursion into statistics, how um, progression is defined in, in, uh, from a statistical point of view. And on the left, you see a normal distributed um, um, population which shows that if you do an infinite amount of measurements, you always get such a, or in, in a normal parameter, you get such a distribution, meaning that you get a mean um, plus minus one standard deviation, everybody knows this from statistics, is roughly 70% of the, of the area under the curve or the data sets um, included, 95% um, is within two standard deviations. And if you go up to three standard deviations, you include 99.7% of all measurements. However, you somehow need to set a threshold. When does progression start or regression start? And um, there's a consensus that this is within the 95% confidence interval, meaning that we have 1.96 standard deviations. If we now consider or think that if you have a regression, I don't care in, in the progression uh, definition. So therefore, and since it's a two-sided test, we only go down to 2.5%, which means that one out of four, 40 um, de 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 diagnosed progressions is false positive, meaning that we do an unnecessary cross-linking in those cases. But since we are only doing three measurements of a patient and uh, not an, an infinite amount of, of measurements, we also have to incorporate the square root of two since we're only doing three measurements and we don't know the exact mean and we don't know the exact distribution. So we have to multiply the standard deviation by a factor of 2.77. And now I'm coming to the study that I'm presenting. We analyzed a group of 133 virgin keratoconus patients, meaning that they have no scars, no use of contact lens, no cross-linking. And we just analyzed the following parameters. 
um, by means of three measurements, three consecutive measurements regarding their repeatability. We had a look at the maximum keratometry. We had a look at the thinnest corneal pachymetry, the thinnest epithelia thickness, as well as the maximal posterior elevation. The first parameter, maximal keratometry, um, in that cohort you can see here. And what the interesting part is that between 45 diopters up to 60 diopters, we are pretty good, meaning that if we multiply the standard deviation by a factor of 2.77, we come very close to that one diopter that is very frequently used nowadays to determine the progression. However, if we are, or if the K max of the, of the patient is above 60, that standard deviation increases substantially as, as shown here, um, maybe up to one or even 1.5 diopters of standard deviation. If you multiply this again by the factor of 2.77, we end up with a delta K max of at least 1.5 diopters. And if we go to 65 or even higher, we end up with, a, um, with an increase of K max of up to five diopters in order to determine a progression and indicate crosslinking. However, we also had a look at other um, repeatability or other parameters regarding repeatability. And um, if we now subdivide that cohort into um, mild keratoconus, moderate keratoconus, and severe keratoconus, we can see that K max is strongly dependent on the state of the keratoconus and the severity. However, the thinnest pachymetry itself, since it's an OCT based measurement, is not that dependent. So here we have a rather independent parameter indicating for mild keratoconus we are on the range of seven microns um, of difference in order to determine a progression and if we go to the very severe cases with a corneal pachymetry of thinner than 430 microns it's only up to 10 uh, uh, microns which is relevant in order um, to determine a significant progression. The maximum posterior elevation again is similar to Kmax it's also dependent on the stage and therefore you cannot use a single value in order to determine progression and the thinnest epithelium again is rather like the thinnest pachymetry, which is rather independent on the, um, on the stage of the keratoconus. So now if we compare this to the, to the Scheinflug system of Pentacum, HR, there was just a recent publication from Belgium in the American Journal showing the repeatabilities um, for different keratoconus cohorts. And there we are for subclinical keratoconus, we are pretty, um, similar with the MS39 compared to the Pentacum. However, if we go to moderate or even more progressed cases, we can see that there's a slight difference regarding um, the, the repeatability, which is actually for, which, which speaks in favor for the MS39 instead of the Pentacum. However, they are pretty similar regarding keratometries. The picture changes completely if we go to the thickness. Here we, um, I, I cited a work of Professor Shetty, who analyzed three Scheinflug systems and analyzed the standard deviation um, of the pachymetry, of the thinnest pachymetry. And he found a standard deviation in all three devices of roughly 10 microns. But again, we have to multiply that factor, uh, that, that standard deviation by a factor of 2.77. And then we end up, in order to determine a progression in keratoconus, we have to have an decrease in pachymetry ranging between 25 up to 30 microns, which is, which is quite a lot. However, if we compare this to the MS39, we only end up with 10 microns, showing that regarding progression in, uh, in terms of pachymetry, we clearly see a superiority um, of the MS39 compared to other Scheinflug systems. This is in particular tr uh, true for um, if you also have scars, which um, interfere due to the scattering nature of the, of the Scheinflug system or very progressed cases. So in conclusion, we can say for the um, MS39 that um, Kmax is depending on the stage of the ectasia and it ranges between 0 0.4 up to 1.5 diopters if we only include cases up to 60 diopters. For the posterior elevation, um, for the maximal posterior elevation, this is again between eight microns and 15 mic microns, but it, that's also only valid up to a K max of 60 or in cases with K max up to 60 diopters. Progression definition with thinnest um, corneal pachymetry is rather independent on the stage and you can use the threshold of 11 microns. And um, the epithelia thickness, again, 
you first have to check the segmentation that is properly segmented. And afterwards, you can say that if there's a decrease between four to six microns, um, you can determine a progression and therefore indicate cross-linking. I would finish with the second case. And um, you can see on the left side, uh, a baseline um, uh, examination. And then on the right side, one month later, you can see a progression of more than one diopter, which actually is quite borderline. And if you have a look at the difference map, you can see that in, in, some, uh, in some points it's even more. So this might be there might be cross-linking necessary. However, if you have a look at the epithelium map, we can see that there's an increase of 11 microns. So progression and an increase in epithelium map, what happened here? And uh, especially if we consider a thickening of uh, more than 25%. And there it's important, always talk to the patient. This patient just had a scleral contact lens fitting, which is which is, which is um, creating a pseudo progression, which is actually not true. So not only rely on the pictures that you acquire, but also talk to the patient, please. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much. I think that those numbers are really interesting and it would be great if CSO could include uh, some guidelines directly on the software so that uh, the technicians or the ophthalmologists taking the measurements uh, have them readily available and can make uh, uh, a diagnosis uh, or suspicion of uh, progression based on uh, published data like yours. So uh, I think that we should all keep them in our minds. Uh, if I see if there's any question from the audience. Uh, okay, there's an interesting question from uh, uh, Simone Inglesi, what about the Gaussian map based KMAX? So uh, I see that you are using the new software, Phoenix. So you are using, I, th I think, also the Gaussian maps. Exactly. However, I, I have to say that I will um, just started using the new software like three weeks ago or four weeks ago. So therefore, I don't have too much experience regarding the, the, the um, Gaussian map based KMAX. You maybe I can help you in answering this question. Uh, can you please back on your first slide, the one with the two maps, uh, the comparison of the two maps? Uh, maybe yes, the, the very first slide can help a lot on understanding this. Yeah, give me a second. Um, that slide, Francesco? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, this one is a, is a picture of a comparison of the, uh, the same eye at the same time, uh, but uh, uh, probably the patient was fixing uh, slightly different uh, on the right in respect to the left. I, don't, I, I cannot say which, which one is the correct decision, but usually uh, this kind of patient uh, might have some issue in fixating the, the, the target. And so that's why you have th this big difference. The big advantage of uh, the Gaussian map uh, is that uh, the Gaussian is a uh, fixation independent. So I guess that uh, you, you should have the same, exactly the same results uh, between uh, the right uh, and the left, uh, uh, and the left uh, image if you look at the fixation map. That's why we are busy now uh, our uh, uh, key marks uh, not on the tangential, but on the Gaussian. The Gaussian map uh, is just about the real bulging. So this image, uh, this uh, um, value um, takes in, into consideration also the astigmatism. But if you change a little bit uh, the fixation, the astigmatism changes. And you can see this on the differential map. Uh, the Gaussian map erases it completely the effect of the astigmatism. And for this reason, I think that uh, for keratoconus project progression, uh, we might uh, take into consideration this new definition of uh, key marks. But we can work it, uh, together on this, if you like. Absolutely, we'd love to. Okay, it's a seven o'clock. And uh, uh, I, I thank uh, Dr. Seller for his nice presentation and uh, interesting numbers. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Jorge Alio uh, to give his talk. Jorge, uh, you are going to talk about 
uh, ocular surface uh, squamous neoplasia, OCT imaging diagnosis. Thanks. Yes, hello. Thank you to everybody and Francesco for the, the invitation. And I'm going to change the topic. Probably it's, it's going to be a fresh change because we are moving forward from the keratoconus to something completely different. That is the ocular surface squamous neoplasia, no? about what are the OCT match diagnosis. As probably you all know that the OSSN, OSSN is the most common malign neoplasia of the ocular surface and presents quite variable clinical appearances. And in the last decades, 12 years, the, the Bascom Palmer team has worked a lot uh, about in, in, on this. It has been a critical progress in the diagnosis and also in the management of, of the ocular surface neoplasias thanks to the, the development of the high resolution OCT that basically has changed completely the way we manage these diseases. As the high resolution OCT allows, in many cases, to confirm the suspected clinical diagnosis and avoid any surgical approach like uh, surgical biopsy. And it's the team of Carol Carp that has worked a lot on this. And, and see the stride for the first time. I, were, I remember uh, about a decade ago when I was an observer there in Bascom Palmer, I was still a, a, a register, and see just a published in ophthalmology, the signs, the three specific signs of the ocular surface scan uh, carcinoma uh, detected by high resolution anterior segmentosity. And these three signs are the thickened, epithelium, the thickened epithelium, the hyperreflective epithelium, and the arbitrary transition zone from normal to normal epithelium. And we see here, this is from her publication, and also these images are going to be published in our incoming, uh, incoming uh, book of, uh, with the spring here about atlas of anterior segmentosity, where we see here, this is the lesion. Uh, here as well, we see that the epithelium is thickened, is hyperreflective, and, the, and there is an arbitrary transition between the normal and the abnormal epithelium. So, but it has changed not only uh, the, the diagnosis, but also the management, the treatment, because today we are treating these lesions, not with, uh, with, not with an aggressive surgery, but many of these we are treating with topical chemotherapy alone, as it has been proven to be an effective and safe approach to treat these lesions, avoiding in many cases the surgery. But in order to do this in a reliable manner, we need to do what is, we need to see what is going on in the lesion, if the lesion is responding to this treatment, to this topical treatment without surgery. And the OCT provides this because the high resolution anterior signal OCT is able to provide us a non-invasive way of seeing if the, if the lesion is, is healed, if it has gone, and also to discard future recurrences. And as we, as we see here in this case of Carol Carp, where this is the, the lesion before the, topic, the topical treatment and after the topical chemotherapy, where we see that the lesion has disappeared. And actually how here in the, with the OCT, we see that the epithelium, this thickened epithelium is gone. Is the, this is not anymore hyperreflective and all the disease is completely disappeared. So the question here, and this is the reason why I'm talking about this is, because all this original data that Carol Karp and her team published was with a prototype, with a, with a, with a prototype, what they call the ultra high definition anterior segment CT. But this was a prototype that it was not commercial available. It's, it is not commercial available. And by that time, the, the anterior segment OCTs that we all had was, they were very poor uh, in the resolution of the anterior segment and they were not useful to manage these diseases. But today, along this last decade, the commercial available anterior segment OCTs like the MS39 have made a great progress in terms of image resolution. And the question is now if this resolution, if this enhanced resolution is enough to undertake all these actions of the OCT and, 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 use, and use them for the differential diagnosis of the, anterior, of the ocular surface lesions. And we have to take into account that the MS39 presents today the highest image resolution among all commercially available anterior segment OCTs. And the question is, if it is enough then, if we can use the MS39 to study these lesions. And I'm gonna answer this question to these questions with the following case report that they had this year. So this is a 92 years old Caucasian patient that came to my clinic just for a regular check. She had macular degeneration, visual loss, she was not complaining about anything. But then on the ocular surface, I could see this lesion that it was quite suspicious, as you can see here, some gelatinous aspect encroaching the corneal, the corneal surface. So of course, uh, the clinical picture is quite obvious of uh, OSSN. And then I decided to, as I had the MS39, to, to see if I could applicate this knowledge that I took from Carol Carp and do it in my on my clinic 
that I, considering that now I have a better anterior segmental CT technology. And then this is the image that I, that, that I could take from this lesion with the MS-39. And, and actually, we'll see that all these three signs were easily uh, visible, as we see here. Here we have the normal epithelium, and here the thickened and hyperreflected epithelium, very suspicious and confirming the diagnosis of neoplasia. Here, the epithelial map, we can see how in the temporal sector, the epithelium is thickened compared with the, the rest of the epithelium. Again, here, thickened, hyperreflective epithelium in the area of the lesion. And we can see now the abrupt transition zone in a way that has never been previously described. As we can see here, this is the anamorphic image that the MS-39 can provide, with that is the, is the way we can have the highest resolution with a, in a resolution of a few microns. Okay, when we can see here the three signs perfectly on a way that I've never seen before. Thickened epithelium, hyperreflective, and with an abrupt transition zone that see how beautiful is seen over here, because when we have the whole picture of the cornea, of course, yes, we see that here there is an arbitrary transition zone, but, but the way it's seen here is beautiful. The only limitation is that we can only take this picture from this central cornea. So if we, and this lesion had the, the characteristic that it was encroaching up to the near paracentral cornea, so we could have this image. So it would be great if, if, if CSO can work and can, could provide us this picture for the limbal area because of if today we have a, only a limbal uh, lesion, then we, don't, we will not have available the anamorphic image, but, but probably this is something that we'll, we can work on that. So this is a comparison about what Carol Karp showed us more than about 10 years ago and what current technology which MS-39 can actually provide us. And we, we can see that, of course, here, we still have some high resolution, but we are not that far from what they call the ultra high resolution anterior segmental CT. Now we have a very high resolution anterior segmental CT, and we actually can now use this knowledge in order to do the differential diagnosis and management, uh, and management of these lesions. And actually I decided to do the topical chemotherapy of this patient with interferon alpha 2b, four times a day for four months, and this is the outcome, where we can see on the clinical picture a full resolution of the lesion, and with the anterior segmental CT, with the MS-39, I could confirm, not only with my eyes at the ZD lamp, but anatomically confirm, almost in a histological level, how this, the, the, the lesion is gone, where the epithelium has completely normalized, and now is, has a normal phenotype, the epithelium all around. The epithelial map has become normal, in this sector now is not thickened anymore, Okay, and the anamorphic image of the cornea is completely normal with a normalized epithelium phenotype. So as a conclusion, anterior segmental CT has proven to be an essential tool for the appropriate differential diagnosis of ocular surface patients, especially useful for the, for the ocular surface scamous neoplasia, and modern management of such lesions with topical che uh, chemotherapy without adjuvant surgery requires this technology because you need it in order to monitor the response to the treatment and determine the complete resolution or any early recurrence. And recent enhancement and advancements in the anterior segmental CT technology with image resolution improvements is allowing commercially available anterior segmental CT devices like the MS-39 to approximate to this previously described prototype of ultra high definition OCT. OCT. And thank you very much. In the next months, we are releasing our atlas of anterior segmental CT, where these cases and much others will be available for, for whoever is interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks uh, for this very interesting case. There was a question from uh, Professor Noyan asking which kind of chemotherapy was used, but uh, you already gave uh, uh, the information in one of the last slides. So I don't know if there's any other question from the audience or from the other panelists. I don't see anybody. So uh, I think of talking about something rare that nobody has questions. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, actually, I don't know how many of us uh, had a good experience. Uh, with the OCSN, uh, I had very little experience. So uh, I also had it in Bascom Palmer 20 years ago, but since then I never saw a case in my practice in Italy. Or at least I think I never, if I saw them, uh, I missed them. Yeah, so I think this is the important thing because all of us, unless you have a specific clinic like Carol Carp, we're not gonna see more than one case per year of this, no more or even less. 
So nobody's going to invest money on, on specific devices in order to diagnose or monitor this. So the important thing is to have commercial available, like for example, MS39, that we can use it for so many things and also now for this. So if one day you have a suspicious case that you are not sure, you don't have to do any specific investment. You can, you can have everything in that machine. That's great. So probably uh, one of the persons that may have some experience on this is uh, Dr. Uh, Anders from uh, uh, Dr. Anders Knudson from uh, the San Rafael Hospital in Milan because uh, he has a uh, great experience in cornea. And I would like to invite him because uh, he's the next speaker. And uh, he has a case of uh, a peripheral flat tear. Hi. Hi, uh, hi, Giacomo. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for letting me participate. Uh, in this uh, conference call. And uh, I, have to, I have to admit that it's very interesting uh, to hear all of you and all of your experiences because uh, we're using uh, this type of technology uh, a lot in our clinic and it has completely revolutionized our management of uh, certain, uh, certain aspects and certain cases. So um, in particular, I work in a, in a cornea clinic, um, but my case will uh, talk about um, a complication in refractive surgery. So um, this was a LASIK patient. Um, first eye, uh, this is the second eye, so this is a left eye. The right eye uh, had a, um, just a normal, normal outcome, just a small opaque bubble layer. This was the left eye, and this, uh, this was the situation we were in before lifting the flap. So, we, uh, we knew that there were two areas of the flap where we needed to be a bit careful. So we have an opaque bubble layer close to the hinge and close by an area which is quite atypical. There's probably an accumulation of air. This patient had uh, no relevant uh, ocular history, no, uh, no history for, um, for membrane, uh, uh, from basement membrane, membrane disease, which we know can be a particular risk factor for uh, vertical gas breakthrough and or other problematics uh, related to air inside the flap. This was a 15-year-old patient who had a minus five uh, myopia and uh, a normal corneal thickness or about 580. And so we decided to slowly dissect the flap and we were very careful in those two areas and everything was going quite well until we reached this point. So in this area, we found a lot of resistance and slowly trying to dissect the flap as we've done in other cases of the big bubble layer where we know that the situation is risky. Now, posteriorly thinking, we should have probably just waited and maybe redone, um, redone the procedure, uh, relifted re another flap on a second day or just proceeded with another technique, but we decided to go on and that was a mistake. We ended up with a small peripheral tear. And in that case, we were, we were able to carefully position the flap and obviously the procedure uh, was aborted. So we had a perfect outcome in the right eye, no problem whatsoever. And the left eye with minus factors, quite unhappy patient because it was quite demanding and a peripheral flap. There. Now, on slit lamp imaging, this was about uh, three days postoperatively. We had a contact lens in place. You can barely see the flap tear. Fortunately, we were lucky enough to not have any epithelial ingrowth because we we're very delicate in the maneuvers, trying to reposition the, uh, the flap in the correct position. And you can faintly see it. OCT was fundamental for different reasons. First of all, we were able to actually see where the flap was discontinued. So we were able to document an apparent problem. And we were also able to measure very precisely the thickness of the flap, which was exactly uh, where we intended it to be. So 120 was the, the planned uh, thickness, flap thickness for the femtolaser. And this was uh, uh, precisely uh, measured with OCT. Unfortunately, we are unable to print this, but I assure you that the, um, the, the thickness parameters coincide. 
So now we had, uh, we had to think about the different uh, uh, possibilities for managing this patient. So uh, first of all, the first thing to do is wait. You have to be sure that uh, no epithelial cells grow in the interface. We uh, gave ourselves about six months. The patient was very comfortable. We informed uh, uh, levels of anxiety actually went down a lot. So we were quite happy with that. And uh, we were thinking of different techniques. Possibilities were PRK, trans-PRK, but we decided that we could push the limits of the technology and think about even performing a deeper flap. We also obviously uh, researched a lot of different options and we'd seen a, a nice paper by Dan Reinstein who had uh, uh, used our team uh, high frequency ultrasound to, um, to measure the flap thicknesses and allow to create a second flap, deeper flap, with a really high safety profile. So we decided to, um, obviously, uh, after uh, having a, a full consent of the patient, we decided to perform a second and deeper flap. And we were actually quite uh, successful in performing it. We aimed at 155 microns, taking uh, into consideration possible problematics with the standard deviation and the uh, imprecision of the, of the femtocut. And we were able to perform a flap which was one millimeter in diameter uh, larger, uh, fully centered on the old flap and um, uh, clearly deeper as you can see in this image. So you can see the two flaps, maybe here on the left, you can, you can see the, the new flap, which is slightly deeper compared to the old flap. Uh, we had no slivering. The, the, problem, uh, the problem of these flaps can be uh, slivers. So when the flap intersects, that can be a huge problem. And we were very careful uh, for that reason in centering the, uh, the docking uh, to allow this one millimeter uh, uh, increase in, uh, in diameter. So we had a one millimeter uh, safety zone basically. And uh, the outcome of the patient was very positive. And had in mind that he wanted to have a LASIK procedure. He, he didn't really want to deal with the post-operative pain and was really motivated with LASIK. And this um, was a very, um, uh, a very good technique for this particular uh, case and we were able to do the surgery safety, safely. Now, obviously we're pushing the limits. Maybe in some cases um, you, you, could, uh, you could easily perform PRK, trans-PRK without um, um, with, with a very good safety profile, but uh, um, we, were, we had a very happy patient and we, we were convinced uh, that uh, this was a, a positive approach in this case. And uh, I, was, I was asked to only, uh, to only present one case and uh, it's very difficult to present one case because we have so many interesting cases thanks to this uh, new technology, which has completely, as I said before, revolutionized um, the way we uh, deal with some patients. Now, um, before Alio was talking about OSSN, we, uh, we clearly use this type of technology. Uh, even in these cases, I'm, I'm thinking about a patient that we saw last year, a 16, uh, 16 year old patient with an HPV associated OSSN, um, uh, conjunctival dysplasia, which was invading the limbus and the OCT imaging was fundamental in uh, finding the correct plane also during uh, surgical maneuvers. So I have to say that um, we, we also use uh, this type of technology for the same type of pathology. And before ending, I would like to show you uh, another few cases. So this was, uh, this was a patient with uh, uh, Lyle syndrome, multiple, uh, multiple grafts, very complicated patient. This is the type of patient you'll be seeing every month in a, in a corner clinic. And uh, he also had a history of hepatic keratitis. He, Presents, uh, he presents in this way, and it's very difficult to, uh, to actually understand something about this eye. Now, obviously, if you're used to seeing these type of patients, or if you're used to seeing this particular patient, you can, al you can always have some suspects, but look at the OCT image. It shows a clear corneal perforation, anteriorization of the uh, IOL, iris diaphragm, and corneal contact. And this type of imaging is very clear, simple, and easy to interpret. And this was after uh, corneal, uh, one week after corneal gluing, um, the anterior segment that clearly improved with deepening of the anterior chamber. And this patient was managed successfully. And also thanks to this quick and simple 
technology. I would also like uh, to show one last case, and uh, I actually added this while while we were while, we, while others were, were speaking because it was really inherent to uh, what Professor Shetty was saying. There are some clear advantages of OCT compared to sign flu, especially when we have uh, cases scattering, as also uh, Seiler uh, previously stated. This is a patient, a young patient with a bilateral corneal opacity, no history of uh, corneal dystrophies. Everything was negative for suspect interstitial keratitis. And the anterior segment is quite uh, remarkable, no, no, no non-remarkable, no, no big problems. You can see a faint opacity in the mid stroma and the patient is, um, is lamenting some sort of photophobia during the evening. Visual acuity, best visual acuity was around uh, a 0 0.9, 1.0 snell, so very good. And this is the Scheinfeld map. So anterior, the anterior uh, surface is imaged correctly, but uh, the posterior surface, absolutely not. I mean, if you look at this map, uh, you, could, uh, you could almost suspect ectasia. And so this first image is Scheinfeld. This is the second. OCT image, which basically uh, shows a quite a normal cornea from a topographic point of view or tomographic point of view. So I think these points are very important because in some cases, especially when there is slight corneal opacity, there, is, there are some clear advantages of OCT technology compared to shine fluid. And even when thinking about progression of keratoconus, I think that when the cornea is transparent, then both technologies are quite accurate in depicting a progression of keratoconus. But what happens in the most advanced cases when there is slight opacity, or what happens when there is a small or a light haze after cross-linking? This is when OCT imaging can really have um, a great advantage over, over shine flu. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, it was interesting uh, to see your cases. Uh, and uh, as a refractive surgeon, I would be curious to see and to know what other surgeons would have done in such a case with a peripheral tear of the flap. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Reinstein, what would you do in a case like this? Um, well, the first thing uh, I would... Um, substitute that femtosecond laser with a more modern femtosecond laser because prevention is key in all complications. Uh, that complication occurred because the standard deviation of that device is so high that because the flap was so close to the epithelium, the gas insipated into the epithelium and basically it was a cryptic buttonhole. Um, and we published a cryptic, cryptic buttonhole many, many years ago where the, in fact, the stroma is broken. And so, in fact, I, I have no doubt that you are not the reason why the flap tore. I think what you experienced was that you exited from the stroma into the epithelium because there was no flap cut in that region. It's a cryptic buttonhole. Um, in the periphery, as you found there, I actually, be, this is a myopic patient? Yes. I actually would have um, taken some scissors, some banana scissors, and I would have cut around that. And I would have left that triangular section uh, in situ. And I would have lifted the flap minus a triangle in the corner. And I would have performed the ablation. If the transition zone might have encroached on that area, I just would have removed the epithelium from the surface so that the ablation is, 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 is uh, the volume is, is, is not truncated. And I would have put the flap back very carefully without overhydrating so that there's no gutter or no gap in that region. And I would have put a bandage contact lens on and the patient would have been perfectly fine the next day. But um, what you did was good because if you're not sure what to do, then you mustn't do anything. And so that's good. Um, and uh, I, I, congratulations, because you did exactly the right thing. And um, the only question I have for you is, um, the, the original flap was programmed at 90? 
No, 120. At 120, oh my goodness, it shows you, you must replace that femto immediately, okay? I mean, can you look at the OCT, go, go back to your OCT. I, I was looking at it very carefully when you put it on. Give me the, give me the OCT of, of the, no, no, that's with edema. You have a contact lens on top of the cornea there, right? Yes, this was a... Uh, uh, Show me the, the, sec, the, one where, the one where you cut the flap again. Yeah, that one, okay. So put that on, uh, put that on big, like big. Yeah, I'm trying, but uh, let me see. Um, uh, Full screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, from current slide, from current slide. Yeah, okay. So if you see here, let's just, assume that the second flap was cut at 155, okay? I mean, obviously, look, look at the right-hand side of the image. Uh, wait a minute, I can um, use um, annotate. So look over here. Look how extraordinarily close the epithelium was to the edge, yeah? So, so clearly, um, clearly, uh, the, the the standard deviation was poor on this femto, and and what? So the qu only question I would ask you is how did you how did you decide to go to one fifty five, because you would have measured the interface that was already there, and then you would have added what? Well, uh, we we looked at we looked at literature re literature regarding this, and uh, we sort of arbitrarily decided to go down until that level. Ah, okay. Well, the, the, I mean, the literature would 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 I would say is that in a case like this, you need to know the standard deviation of your cutting device. So, in this case, uh, wh wh which femto was that, by the way? Uh, we're talking about uh, that two hundred. Okay, so I don't know what the standard deviation is. Maybe it's 10 microns or 12 microns. And you have to add three standard deviations to have a one in a thousand chance of crossing the interface, right? Approximately. So if it was 12, you'd add 36 microns to that 120, 130, 40, and 50, Six. Oh, that's nice. So now you have a 155, and that's how you calculated perfectly uh, where to go with your second flap. So it's, it's about, it's just statistics. So we, we, we teach a lot about second flaps below and above original flaps and all the techniques that we would use to lift those. And it, it but of course, it's all based on a knowledge of the standard deviations. And what just bringing it back to the to the subject of the evening, the fact that you can image a flap in three dimensions uh, with this kind of precision is really special because it means that the management of complications becomes easy, right? If you have a diagnosis, you, you know exactly what to do next. I think that things like trans-PRK and PRK in this situation are the old way of approaching these problems. Because in the old days, there was no knowledge of anatomy. And so you just, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not gonna take a risk. I'm just gonna do, I'm gonna put the patient through a lot of pain and, and, and anxiety and hassle for a month because I don't know what to do. And, and I think what you did here was fantastic because you, you used powerful imaging and, and measurement technology to plan the next surgery. And, and that's, that's just fantastic. Yeah, congratulations. Okay, I think that uh, it's just 7.30. So it's time for you to present your cases, uh, the, your curious case and <laughs> curious. diagnosis. So the war is still to you. Well, thank you. I, 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 that was not my title. I'm not sure where that title came from. Curious case. Uh, um, Maybe from Francesco, I don't know. Okay, Francesco, what do you mean by curious? <laughs> you mean like like strange or peculiar or? <laughs> it's not my fault. 
<laughs> All right. So um, can you see uh, can you see everything correctly here? Does it look right? Can you see this slide? I see them well. Okay, good. And, and, and okay, okay. So I'm going to just try in the next few minutes um, uh, do a little tour of some things, and I'm going to stop and ask questions at some points also. Um, and um, I, I mean, obviously, I don't have to explain my history with the epithelium because I was the first person to measure it in 1991, and the rest is history. And it's amazing to see Rohit and all of you just talking about epithelium as if it's completely obviously evident that this is a powerful tool and it's such a joy for me to see. And I actually, it's really CSO that made this come to life uh, because um, the RTVU, which I, I have a prototype of is fantastic, but it doesn't do everything. And this machine does everything. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. One of the points I want, I, I, some slides I just created on the spur of the moment also, um, just when we were talking about repeatability and K-max and progression and stuff like that, I wanted to point out just how extraordinarily repeatable this machine is. So here's an example of a patient I saw an hour ago. And this is the pre-op and this is the post-op uh, topography. No complications, just normal. So the pre-op was in July, 1919. This map was taken in today, okay? So that's a year and a bit later. This is the difference map. So there's my hyperopic correction, sagittal maps, yeah? This is the epithelial thickness profile change. So this was pre-op and this is post-op. So as you can see, there's a ring of thicker epithelium around where there was a hyperopic ablation from the presbyon procedure. And there was a, a, a reduction of central epithelium by five microns because, of course, the cornea is steeper in the center, so it causes focal thinning relative to pre-op. So th th the, this is exactly what we've described with ultrasound for years, okay? And I did it like that. It used to, it used to take me an hour to get this data when I had to do it manually with, with our prototype ultrasounds. But what I really wanted to show you was this. This is the posterior surface difference map. And what do you see? You see it is one color. It's green, the difference map. There is not a single device that we have ever used since the OrbScan one until now, where you do a difference map of a cornea that has had surgery, let alone a virgin cornea, a cornea that has had surgery. And 14 months later, the back surface is exactly the same as per the diagnostic device. So this is impressive to me, okay? The fact that, you know, we show all the changes, but the back surface has not changed, which of course it doesn't. And the device shows that it hasn't changed. I think all of you know what I'm talking about when you look at back surface difference maps with, I'm not gonna mention any names, but other devices, okay? So to me, this is sexy stuff. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is talk about um, in general, so how these applications uh, apply, because I noticed that there were still questions coming up about epithelium and keratoconus even though Rohit was amazing at explaining exactly what his thinking is when he's looking at how epithelium affects topography. And I'm gonna finish with the curious case. Um, and you know my financial uh, disclosures, they've been the same for 20 years. Um, this, I shared this uh, just now in the chat line um, because you know, the point is, as we were talking one minute ago, is diagnosis is what leads you to seem like you're smart in a surgical situation. And you cannot arrive at diagnosis unless you have data. And refractive surgery has been almost like a black magic for many years, which works incredibly, but when it doesn't, we don't know what to do. And that's because we have been lacking the cross-sectional anatomical diagnostic technology. I have had it, fortunately, 
for my entire refractive surgery career, because that's just luck. I was doing research. It happened to have been applicable to refractive surgery. I got into refractive surgery. I used it. But now everyone can have this kind of stuff. And it is really, really exciting. So what I think of now is I think of the slit lamp as you know, a device which is very useful. And it's the slit lamp, which was invented in the 20th century. And for me, as you can see, I've replaced the keratometer, which would have gone here 100 years ago. And I've replaced it with an MS-39 because this is the slit lamp of the 21st century. And I have my own, my own, we have four testing rooms here and four MS-39s, but I have my own MS-39 because I can make diagnoses. I see a lot of complications. That's obviously, you know that. And for me to be able to examine a cornea where I want it exactly the way at which angle and then make some measurements and come back and look at it again and look at something else. As you will see in my curious case at the end, you will understand what I'm talking about. So for me, this is now, take, this is almost an essential tool for the refractive surgeon. And, you know, it's obvious that we published a lot and we published the original stuff on using epithelium and keratoconus. First, the relationships, then how you use epithelium to measure keratin or to detect keratin. And finally, how you can do LASIK on corneas that have suspect topography if you have epithelial maps and not get keratoconus, not get ectasia. So we, we published this um, triptych, if you like, of this story, and that all finished in 2009. What's the principle? The principle is simple. In a normal cornea, you have a front surface, a stromal surface and a back surface, and in between you have that epithelium. If there is very mild keratoconus, or, or you know, you start to get this bulge on the front, what happens? The epithelium becomes thinner over the bulge; it becomes thicker around the bulge, and you know, the back surface, the front surface, etc. But if the keratoconus is subclinical, before you can see it on the front surface. You will still get this change, but the epithelium has the opportunity of fully compensating for the stromal surface irregularity. And Rohit was talking about stromal surface topography. Absolutely. But remember that until this device came on the market, all we could do was look at surface topography and epithelial maps. And the point being, as he showed a number of examples where you have inferior steepening, but it's because the epithelium is thick in that region, not because of keratoconus. And the back surface is not as sensitive a measure until now for detecting keratoconus because just a little bit of back surface elevation that is focal could be normal. But if you have back and front surface elevation concordantly elevated in the same place with focal thinning and focal thinning of the epithelium in the same region, well, then it's very likely to be a keratoconus. But you cannot have thick epithelium over a stromal ectasia focal region. So you can exclude keratoconus that way. And like I said, we published the keratoconus epithelium showing the donut pattern, classic donut pattern, and exploiting, we, we, we published the normal profile, of course, and exploiting this difference between the keratoconic and the normal is what led us to develop these algorithms for keratoconus detection. So here's an example of a 37-year-old with 2012 best corrected, plus 150 minus a quarter, relatively very flat cornea. This patient wants refractive surgery. We do a pentacam and we see that the D value is normal, although DT, the thickness progression, is a little bit abnormal. And the cornea is thin. It's a 477 
according to the Pentagon. So that's thin, right? And some people say, oh, you can't do LASIK under 500, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we get an epithelial map. This is from high frequency ultrasound, of course. And we see this classic donut pattern under this totally normal topography. And when we look at the standard deviation of the pattern deviation from the population, we see that there is focal thinning in that region. And now we correlate that to the back surface change and we see, oh my goodness, this is really elevation, which is not according to the statistics of the back surface significant, but it's correlated with focal epithelial thinning that has not yet protruded to the front surface. And this patient, despite being plus 150, 2012, and has excellent contrast, this patient has keratoconus, according to our classifier, which we published in IOBS about 10 years ago. So this is where the power of the epithelium comes. And anybody who says to me, oh, but I can't afford an MS-39, I say to them, no, you're wrong. You cannot not afford of an MS-39. That was a double negative, yeah? The reason being that the number of cases that you pick up that you can do surgery on in a very short time pays for your device. So even if you're, if you're only thinking about money, which of course nobody does, we're all trying to do the best for patients regardless of the money, but even if that's all you do, you're gonna pay for it very quickly. And in our study, which, which I showed you, we had, uh, we demonstrated a 7% of the uh, increase in our total LASIK volume because 13% or 16% of all of the cases we thought were suspect, in fact, were not keratoconic once we looked at the epithelium. So this is a critical, critical thing. Now, the beautiful thing, and I've said this you know, already, I'm gonna say it again, is that I had to get a front surface and then I had to get a back surface on another device. And then I had to get an epithelial map on ultrasound. And then I had to look at them all together and you know, suck my thumb and say, okay, what's this? Now, all of these maps are automatically acquired simultaneously with exact registration between all of the surfaces. And I can put my cursor exactly where I want and I can see the same position in all the other surfaces and I can make a decision like that about whether a cornea is normal or not. There is no way, in fact, there is no way you cannot have this device if you're doing refractive surgery. And it's sadly, I mean, sadly, I mean, good for CSO, it's the only device that does this. All of the other devices do some of this, but not the rest of it. And so obviously they're all gonna copy CSO, but currently CSO has done the job and they're years ahead. Not to mention that um, Francesco's keratoconus screening is actually very good at picking up normals when, for example, a pentacam says it's abnormal. So the D value and the Bell and Ambrosio plots can be quite off-putting. And then you go to the, this, this uh, uh, corneal wavefront-based analysis and you find that in fact it's deemed as normal. So uh, I think it's very useful in that sense to be able to protect yourself against over um, enthusiastic diagnoses of keratoconus when there isn't. Now, let me show you some cases. Then. So here's an example. He's a 35 year old Asian uh, female, totally normal, no big deal refraction, except, you know, against the rule of astigmatism, no big deal. And this topography. So, What year are we in here looking at this topography? Well, we're in 19, like 2000, well, 1997, because this machine was available then, but the orb scan was on, had just come on the market. But most surgeons were still just looking at the front surface. And they say, oh, it's warm for us. Oh, I should just do PRK or, or whatever. Then we can move into 2006 and we can look at the pentagon. Well, what do we think of this? Well, it's a thick cornea and the back surface is well, a bit wonky. 
Uh, oh, look, that's front, back. I don't know. Uh, who knows? Uh, tangential. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? And then you have these big forums and big courses where 25 people are giving their opinion about this thing. And everyone's like, mm, I would have done this and I would have done that. And all you have to do is look at the epithelium. Okay. So here, and by the way, that was just epithelium. Um, here's another example where the back surface looks not great. Okay, the D is not a high value, but the DB and the DP are slightly elevated. And all you have to do is look at the epithelial mapping. And once you do that, you change. So one of the things I wanted to point out here is that the standard color scales that come with the machine, um, you, you, you really need to right mouse click on the color scale and change the color scale. Because as you can see, you can, you can actually emphasize the borders of, 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 of what's happening by just changing the color scale on the same cornea. And then you correlate and you say, oh, well, there is like a donut pattern in conjunction with this back surface elevation. You know what? <laughs> okay, we have our answer here. Okay, so beautiful examples. Here's another 25 year old white female, unremarkable, no contact lens wear. That, of course, can affect the appeal profile and change the topography. We have some symmetrical oblique astigmatism in both eyes. And this is the topography. So, you know, normal pattern, ectasia without a cause, everything was normal. Very, very uh, tight scale here. This is a quarter, quarter diopter scale, just to show this out. If you were looking at this on a Kleist scale or something with a one diopter or one and a half diopter step, the whole thing would just look green. And then we look at the Bell and Ambrosio and all of these are white. Everything looks fantastic. Everything's happy. Everything looks the same. Yes, let's do the case. Let's do the case, right? I mean, no one would say let's not do the case, but of course I'm presenting it right now and you have just been talking about this for five minutes. So we look at the epithelium and we say, oh, wait, okay, hold on a second there is actually a focal thinning. And if we change the color scale to get that emphasized, we can see that there is focal thinning uh, in conjunction with where the back surface was elevated. So I think, you know, we're there. And I think, uh, you know, the fact that there are 150 plus people on this call, um, and I think that's, that's great and it's very exciting. So let me finish. And I'm leaving myself a little extra time because uh, I have been asked, as if this isn't a surprise, I've been asked to give you a surprise. And I hope you don't mind me uh, indulging. But this is a really interesting case um, because it involves anatomy. So here's a smile case. And I, this is very late in my smile career. And in fact, this case happened the month that I was uh, reviewing the final galleys to our smile textbook. So that's how late in my smile career this case was. So this case occurred and it wasn't in the textbook because it occurred after the textbook was already kind of written. And what I had was a bizarre situation where I created a false plane, despite my extraordinary experience phenomenally uh, 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 talented uh, fingers and hands and instruments, I still had a complication. That's what can happen. You can always, you have to always be on guard no matter how good you think you are. So well, anyway, the point is I created a false plane and I dissected it and I didn't realize I had a false plane until quite late in the game. Thankfully, I, I did realize it and I stopped dissecting and I left it in place. And what I did was I took the patient directly to the MS-39. And um, so, so I'm gonna show you this. And I, this is without taking the lenticule out, I took him to the MS-39. So here's a section of the superior cornea. Here's a section nasally and so on and so on. So let's think about what we're looking at here because it's a lot of pieces in the puzzle. So obviously here's the lenticle. 
and here's the edge of the lenticule, and here's some interface, okay? Now we're gonna go around here and we see that there seems to be the lenticule, see, well, there seems to be another cut down here. Well, let's go one further. Ooh, okay. So there's a lower interface, which then doesn't meet, doesn't meet with the cap interface, but goes down parallel to the cap interface. Well, that's a false plane, guys. That's a false plane. And we can look at it at another angle where it's really quite far away from the cap interface, which was at 120 microns or something. And by the way, you know, look, look at look at the stromal edema, right? Because I've just taken them out of the opening. Okay. And we're going to go now to the vertical. And now we see uh, the, 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 the lenticule, but we see that there is a, a sort of a V-shaped lip here. So we see that my instrument punched into this false plane here because cornea is soft, especially down there at a 250 um, micron level because it's a, a minus 11 patient by the way, in a study. So we have a high myopia smile study that we were running. And there is the interface that I should have crossed to the edge of the lenticule, but the instrument jumped down and went and created a false plane. And around here, we see another angle of that. Here it's joined, here it's joined. So now, now when I've sat in front of this thing for 10 minutes and thought about it, now I'm able to draw a diagram. And I'm able to draw a diagram that tells me exactly which region I have falsified a plane and where I have not falsified. So now I've got a three-dimensional map in my mind of where the interfaces are. And I know from the, from the OCT, I know that the lenticule was, pr was produced perfectly. There's nothing wrong with the lenticule cut. What's wrong is that the instrument went past here and went down instead of across. And what I need to do is I need to find that edge. I need to find that edge right there. Because if I can find that edge right there and dissect inward, I'm going to separate the lenticule. No problem. So that's exactly what we did. We waited a month. We made it for the swelling to come. In. And we also were able to, because this device has these tools, we were able to make measurements to confirm the diameter of the lenticule, the, you know, the, the cap, to lenticule um, cap space. And just with some measurements, just make sure that we're not wrong in what we're looking at. We're also able to measure the lenticule thickness sitting in his cornea at one month post-op. And interestingly, it was a lot thicker than planned. So that tells me that there is still swelling in the lenticule. And that explains why he started minus 11, and now he's minus 24, minus 6. This is why his cornea is steeper, because I've got a lot of edematous lenticule, which is not detergesin in the middle of his interface, probably because he has separated stroma, and this tissue is just sitting in the middle, and it's, there's nothing, there isn't enough oncotic pressure or a vacuum, as you like, to suck out the water of the lenticule because there is an interface that is not communicating adequately for detergents. There's no tension in this, in this lenticule. It's just sitting there, a little piece of tissue in the middle of the cornea. So what do you think I should do? Trans-PRK? <laughs> or, no, of course not. It's very simple. I'm going to go, it's so simple, okay? I'm going to split this out. This is the surgeon view, right? That's the in, in, inferior superior temporal nasal. I'm going to make a small incision with my software. I'm going to program with the circle software. I'm just going to program a small incision. The way you do that is you program a, 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 a flap with 
a very, very large hinge. So the hinge is, um, sorry, the hinge is this, this is the hinge and that's the flap if you like, right? So I made myself a three millimeter access point and I made some marks on the cornea so that I can make sure that I'm aligned. And I then come in, the plan is to come in through the incision and separate the lenticule edge the same way I do every day, super temporally, but I'm gonna do it intranasally now through that new incision. And I know that if I can find that edge, if I can find that edge, then I can reach in and I can handshake my instruments and prove that I'm underneath. And then I can use partially dissect one side and then the other side and use a fulcrum and then just take out the lenticule and Bob's your uncle. And there's the lenticule with a little bit of staining on it. So I've taken it out straight from where it was created. No problem. And you know, this lip here that I'm leaving behind is visible post-op, right? Because now I've gone to the correct interface and removed the lenticule. And so not only I've diagnosed what has happened using this very powerful imaging technology, and I've been able to make measurements, and I've been able to prove that I removed all of the lenticule, and I know exactly where he still has a false plane, and I can also, with the same device, look at difference maps and show that everything I did was nice and correct. And his best spectacle corrective vision is still the same as pre-op. And his refraction is, you know, it's great. So very, very nice. I, 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 and finally, I just want to, so, uh, Rohit mentioned this, and, and I, I, I want to emphasize that um, well, actually, um, Dr. Zeiler mentioned this also. He talked about the repeatability. And he did mention checking the epithelial uh, uh, segmentation. I, I think that if you're going to make a decision, a surgical decision based on epithelium with this device, I think you need to manually check the segmentation every time. Because you can't rely on an algorithm that is looking at gray on gray to be as good as you. And so I, I've just made a little video here from, uh, well, Ryan uh, Vida, my research optometrist, made this video for you, showing you how it's sped up a little bit. He's not this fast, um, uh, but he showing you how you can go through and erase and recreate these interfaces going through every angle, every single angle back and forth in a complex cornea. Okay, here we go, redoing that little bit, okay. And now we've got a really good idea what the epithelial profile is. And by the way, here's the Artemis Insight 100, uh, which of course we know is the gold standard with one micron precision. And look at that, it's beautiful. I mean, obviously we have a 10 millimeter zone. This is a, you know, it's OCT, so it doesn't, it's, um, it can't get the whole uh, periphery, but the center is where the information is that I need. And I can make surgical decisions about transitorial PTK and how much tissue I should remove and from where. And I can also make predictions about the refractive shift that I'm going to expect after this transitorial PTK just from one device. So, you know, um, I don't have a financial interest in this device. I wish I did. <laughs> uh, um, maybe I should. Maybe one day I will. But the point is, I'm in love with this thing. I was, I, I, Francesco, you're still online. You haven't left, okay. Uh, when, when, when Francesco gave me the opportunity of playing with the prototype, whenever it was three or four years ago, I was like, in one second, I was like, when can you get me four of these things? Because I need four, I have four testing groups. And for me, that meant the end of all the other diagnostics. The only reason I keep the other diagnostics is because I need legacy testing with old patients. I want to be able to test on the same machine and then transfer that difference map in the record so that I can then move on with a tomographer, tomographer, topographer, and diagnostic device with all the optics. And I mean, we haven't even talked about inter the work that Jorge Alio has done on the intracorneal segment rings with the AI from Francesco's group. And there's just so many applications on this device. So uh, congratulations, I, I say to, uh, to uh, CSO for um, you know, being first to market, 
and best in market uh, all at once. Congratulations, that's a, a really great, great thing. And congratulations to all of you because you're all using this device um, like total experts. And it's, it's just such a pleasure to watch. So well, well done, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if there's any question for Dr. Reinstein. Uh, I think it's eight o'clock, so we don't have a lot of time. But uh, if any panelist or any attendee would like to have any other question to uh, all, uh, for all for any speaker, we can still have five minutes of time. But otherwise, uh, I just want to remember uh, that uh, uh, if you go to the what's new section of the uh, website of CSO, uh, then uh, and you leave a feedback, uh, uh, this will uh, provide uh, CSO will provide you with uh, a new copy of the atlas. I think I think that. Something new is happening in the house of Dr. Reinstein. So no more OCT. Uh, um, you all know that I'm a, a, big, a big fan of ultrasound. Um, and of course, as you can see, I, I have, um, I'm now a big fan of, um, of optical. Yeah. So, but I'm still a fan of, of sound. Maybe not ultrasound, but, but sound. Uh, so yes, I... I I was asked whether um, whether I would uh, finish the session, but I mean, I, I want—I mean, not only if there's questions, I, I would finish the session with and let everybody leave uh, with a little bit of music. Okay, thank you. There's no questions. I don't see any question. All right. Well, I'm going to play a, a very, very famous piece, um, uh, which you all know. And I think the name of this piece, uh, this, this, is, this is on my, I, I'm putting a record out. I was going to put it out this year, but it's um, COVID made it impossible to go to jazz festivals this summer. Um, so I'm, I'm putting this out next year, but you, you can hear a preview of this record. And this is one of the tunes on the record. Some of the record is very hard, uh, heavy jazz. And then this tune is the one which I put on so that we can possibly get some radio radio play time uh, for uh, for the general public, and it's and it's a very um, and the title of this tune is very uh, apt for this symposium um, because those people who don't use uh, an MS thirty nine uh, they're going to be saying the title of this tune over and over again in their refractive surgery practice. Thank you. 
I don't know. Could, could you hear did, did that? Could you hear that there? Was it? Uh, yeah. W was it audible? Yeah, yeah. Very well. Congratulations. You never know with these things. Uh, it was perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. To, to everybody, and thanks to CSO for this uh, wonderful meeting. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye, Francesco. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.